The historic Romans excelled at some things while failing at others. They were constantly overshadowed by their Greek counterparts in abstract studies and literature. You contacted a Roman if you needed someone to construct for you a sewer system, a floating bridge, or a weapon that could throw blazing balls of sand and grease 300 yards out. Despite having very elementary math skills, they built models, explored, and constructed as robustly as they could to make up for their incapacity to compute for pressure and load. In the contemporary age, we tend to take internal space for stride, but we shouldn't. Ancient civilizations could not have imagined the size of our massive domed arches, gigantic atriums, metal skyscrapers, or even a basic high school gymnasium. Even the greatest designers had to deal with the challenge of a massive stone ceiling before the Romans achieved dome building. Even the Parthenon and the pyramids, the biggest pre-Roman feats in construction, looked considerably more spectacular from the outside. Roman domes, in comparison, were roomy, open, and for the very first time in history, they truly conveyed a sense of inner space. Dome technology was largely made possible by the accessibility of concrete. It was born out of the realization that the fundamentals of the entablature could be rotational movement into three components to start creating a structure with the same supporting power but a smooth, larger area. On a hardwood scaffold, this mixture was poured into molds, leaving the dome's sturdy, hard exterior behind. Roman siege weapons were mostly created by the Greeks, who later improved them, as was the case with a lot of technology. Ballistae, which were essentially enormous crossbows that could hurl heavy stones throughout sieges, were mainly back-engineered versions of Greek weaponry that had been captured. Ballistae propelled projectiles up to 500 yards using looping of knotted animal sinew. They functioned something like springs in large mousetraps whenever the sinews were securely wound and afterwards permitted to snap back 457 meters. This weapon could also have been equipped with javelins or huge arrows and then used to pick off soldiers of opposing troops because it was light and accurate as an anti-personnel weapon. During sieges, disclosing this information was frequently employed to attack little buildings. Romans also developed their unique siege engines, tossing heavier rocks, termed onagers. A fluid rock that is stronger and lighter than a typical stone is difficult to top when it comes to technological advancements in construction materials. Roman concrete was indeed a unique blend of sand, lime, volcanic ash, debris, and other materials. The mixture was not only pourable into any shape you could create a wooden mold for, but it was also significantly more powerful compared to any of its constituent elements. Concrete was a low-cost, flame-resistant building material. It had the flexibility to withstand earthquakes that frequently hit the volcanic Italian peninsula and could even be positioned underwater. Roman engineering cannot be discussed without mentioning their well-built roads, many of which are still used today. It would be equivalent to contrasting a cheap watch with a Swiss model to compare our modern asphalt roads to a Roman road from antiquity. They were durable, precise, and strong. Roman roads were typically approximately three feet thick and incredibly resilient to the effects of time. One of the peculiarities of Roman engineering is found in the wonderful sewers of the Roman Empire because, despite their size and complexity, they weren't really intended to be drains in the first place. Instead, they just sort of happened to be that way. The Cloassa Maxima, or biggest sewer, as it is more well known, was once only a waterway constructed to drain some nearby marshes. Around 600 BC, the first holes were dug, and for the next 700 years, even more streams were added. It's difficult to determine whether the Cloassa Maxima transitioned from serving as a drainage ditch to a true sewer, because extra channels were created whenever it was thought necessary. Even though it started off crude, the Cloassa Maxima quickly developed, spreading its roots farther and farther into the city. Romans were among the first to discover a way to heat a room without completely destroying the building. They designed an elevated floor that was pressurized with warm air and water vapor from an adjoining furnace, 
enabling heat to circulate underneath the surface and in vacuous pipes in the walls without having smoked out its occupants. This was done instead of directly trying to introduce fire or vapors into a room. The aqueduct is a system of magnificent bridges, above ground water systems and underground pipes that bring water from the farmland into the city. Just to provide Rome with pure water, there were 250 miles of irrigation systems by the 3rd century. Many of the ancient world's largest aqueducts still survive today because they were so expertly constructed. The founder of Roman engineering, Vitruvius, mentions various innovations in water power technology. The serrated gear and the hydraulic wheel, two Greek inventions, were combined by the Romans to create sophisticated sawmills, wheat mills, and turbines. Another Roman invention, the miscalculated wheel, operated underneath the force of water flowing instead of falling water, enabling the construction of floating water wheels for the grinding of grain supply. The Romans certainly didn't create the arch, but they did polish it, much like they did with nearly every one of the engineering achievements we've highlighted. Before the Romans took control of them, arches had been in use for close to 2,000 years. Arches don't necessarily need to be uninterrupted, that is, they aren't required to span a distance in one motion, as Roman engineers discovered. They might be divided into many smaller portions, rather than attempting to span gaps in one giant leap. As long as each segment had struts underneath, it wasn't required to transform an arch into a precise semicircle. The segmental arch played a role in this. Military engineering predominated in Roman engineering. Those roads for which they are so well known were not so much constructed for everyday usage, but more for marching legions swiftly into the countryside, striking trouble spots and leaving again. A similar function was performed by Roman-designed pontoon bridges, which were specialization of Julius Caesar's, and were usually built during times of war for the impact of sudden raids. The Rhine Bridge built by Caesar was ingenious for a few reasons. Engineers had to move quickly since it is famously difficult to construct bridges without diverting a river, and it is considerably more challenging in a military context when construction must be constantly guarded. Engineers strengthened the foundation by ramming timbers into the riverbed at an inclination, against the current, instead of driving beams directly into the water. In order to stop or slow down any possibly hazardous logs that could float down the river, protective floating docks were also driven upstream. After the beams were finally fastened together, a hardwood bridge was constructed on top of them. The building process took just 10 days in all, was entirely made of local wood, and made a clear statement to the surrounding tribes about just the strength of Rome. If Caesar desired to cross the Rhine, he could. That's all for today's video and thanks for watching it. If you liked it, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and share it with your friends. And before you leave, make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already done so, and turn on notifications to never miss any updates. I will see you in the next video. Take care and stay tuned.